Thousands of years ago, God created everything. He created things like the rain, and He created people just like you and me. Also, a thousand years ago, men and women rebelled against God and His goodness, spurning Him for His kindness in creating them, having no interest in giving the credit due His name, deciding for themselves what was right and wrong, choosing which words they would say, yeah, that's true, and choosing which ones they'd say, no, I don't think so. I think I'm going to go a different way. In this opposition to God, man condemned themselves to death. An expectation hangs over all of humanity of just judgment from God for our, condom, for our rebellion against Him. Yet, in the midst of our rebellion, while we were yet in sin, God became a man named Jesus Christ. He came and He lived the life that we were ordered to live, but we were unable and un- untrustworthy to do that. Rebelling against God, Jesus came instead in our place to obey God and even to obey Him to the point of a cross. Have you ever thought about the fact that we put the capstone of our rebellion against God in the moment that we put God on the tree? We pinned Jesus, God in the flesh, up on the cross, killing Him once for all putting the cherry on top of our rebellion. Yet, that was God's plan to redeem us. It was actually through our rebellion of killing Jesus that God planned to pour out all of our punishment upon Jesus so that all who would trust in Him would have their sins forgiven, would no longer be considered opponents of God, but but friends with God. Look, Jesus didn't just defeat sin, He also defeated death. Three days after being killed on the cross, He rose to life, showing that He was starting a new humanity, that all who would trust in Jesus would be right with God and could expect eternal life with Him. Jesus is now King, reigning and ruling over all humanity, over all the earth, over all creation. Everyone who trusts in Jesus has a hope of eternal life with Him. I just explained to you the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And for you, that inflamed your heart again with gladness. You've heard this message thousands of times from Pastor Paul. This is is the message that we hold united and in common. This is the message of salvation. That everyone who hears this message and calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you're a Christian in here this, in this room today, that's the message you've trusted in. But did you know this message has not been heard in the whole earth? Truly, there are places in the earth that the name of Jesus has never been formed. There are peoples in this earth who have never heard his name, understood the message that I just described. Well, how could that be? We've heard this thousands of times, but they have never heard it. That's why we have this passage today. If you haven't opened up your Bibles yet, now would be a good time. We're in Romans chapter 15. We're in verses 14 through 21 today. This passage demands that we reckon with that reality. That reality that there are places and peoples in the earth that unless a messenger comes with that message that I just spoke to you, they have no hope of salvation. That's why in, you've already studied Romans 10. How can they believe if they haven't heard? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can someone preach unless they are sent Those realities drive us to this passage today. It's an honor for me to get to preach this passage to you. Uh, uh, I serve as an elder of a church in Kansas City where I get to lead our global disciple-making efforts. Um, I get to lead a, a program called Fusion that you have sent some of your students to, uh, Miss Kara and, and Mr. Phil. Um, 
uh, Miss Brandy and, and Pastor Paul. Uh, they've sent their children down to us at Spurgeon College with Fusion, where we train for a, a full school year, and then we send our students to some of the hardest places on the planet, places like this, where the name of Jesus is not known. And so the reason that I've been asked here today is I want to show you this passage. This passage gives us the plan. God is not powerless. We sang this morning that He will have the victory. In every battle, He wins. And this battle for the souls of mankind, this battle for the nations, it will be won. And the beauty is, Cornerstone Church, you're part of it. The Lord is and will use you to win this victory. The end is already written. Every tribe, every tongue, every nation will be represented there, but we're not there yet, and you get to be a part of getting us there by the power of God. And so I want us to know that today we need this passage. We need it badly. The, the Romans needed this passage because for them, uh, as we, we will see in just a moment, uh, they had everything they needed, just as you do. You have what you need. You have the gospel. You have the good news. You are able to instruct one another. And we've been given this letter with some very very bold truths. And when the Romans received that, it demanded a little bit of an explanation. Why would Paul, a stranger to us, write such a bold letter to us who are Christians, who know these truths? He's going to explain, the reason I'm writing to you is because of my calling to be a missionary I have to explain this gospel to you with clarity and power. And I want you to send me to preach this gospel to Spain. At that time, the ends of the earth where they had never heard before. And so that was the purpose of this passage for the Romans. But what about for us? Why are we here today? Why, why, why am I speaking to you? What, what purpose does this have for us? Well, there's two purposes. Number one you've got to understand what a missionary is. You need to know what they do. You need to know what the results are of their work. You need to know what their, their aspirations are, what their heart is. And the second purpose, not just to know these things, you need to know them because you are and you need to continue sending missionaries to the nations. Perhaps today, the Lord might tap one of you and say, I'm calling you to be a missionary. Or perhaps there will be people in the coming days that will come to this church and they will say, I'm called to serve as a missionary to the ends of the earth. And this passage will tell you whether or not to send them. Perhaps this passage will stir this church up to greater generosity so that you will sustain and support those that you've already already sent. So that is my prayer, that today you will understand what a missionary is And that by God's grace, you will be more and more faithful at fulfilling God's mission through the sending of missionaries. So as we jump into Romans 15, we're going to be looking at verses 14 through 21. And I want you to see three sketches of the life of a missionary. Three sketches of the life of a missionary. The first sketch that you're going to see is called the ministry of a missionary the ministry of a missionary. And we're going to see that in verses 14 through 16. And concerning you, my brethren, I myself also am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able also to admonish one another. But I have written very boldly to you on some points so as to remind you again. Because of the grace that was given me from God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, ministering as a priest the gospel of God, so that my offering of the Gentiles may become acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Now there's a lot there, but what we're seeing in these three verses is the ministry of a missionary. And we're going to see three, th- four things about the ministry of a missionary. And the first thing we're going to see about their ministry is that the missionary is appointed by God. The missionary is appointed by God. Look again with me at verse 15. It says, I've written to you very boldly on some points so as to remind you again, because of the grace that was given me from God 
to be a minister of Christ Jesus. Those two phrases there you saw point to the reality that missionaries are appointed by God. It's the phrase, this grace has been given to me. Another understanding of the word grace here is a gift. God has graciously given this gift of apostleship to me, Paul. He gives this gift of missionaries to the church. And that they might be, as it says here, ministers of Christ Jesus. Look, he appointed Paul to be a missionary. You remember Acts chapter 13 when the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul to the work that I have called them. That's the Holy Spirit speaking to the church. Set apart, appoint them, set them aside for the work I have called them to. This is what happens in our worship gatherings, is that God, by His Holy Spirit, sets apart men and women for this task. He appoints them to be missionaries. But the second thing I want you to see here about the ministry of a missionary is that the missionary serves among the nations. You see that in verse 16? He says, to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. As Paul was appointed a missionary to the Gentiles, God continues to appoint in our midst missionaries to the nations. That phrase there, to the Gentiles, you can uh, translate that into English as Gentiles. But that word beneath Gentiles is the same word that Pastor Paul referred to in the Great Commission. What is the Great Commission? Go and make disciples of all nations. That word, ethnos, is, it, is the same word as Gentiles here. And so this is what, as Paul hands off his ministry to the churches, as he hands it off to Timothy and to Titus and to the other apostles that are being sent out through uh, Paul's ministry, this is what is happening. The, the call to make disciples of all nations is, is being fulfilled through missionaries being sent out to all nations. And so this is what missionaries do. They serve among all nations. The third thing that you see about the ministry of missionaries is that the missionary preaches the gospel. So this answer is what? What does a missionary do? They're appointed by God. They go among nations, but when they get there, what do they do? They preach the gospel. Look at verse 16 again. It says, To be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, ministering as a priest the gospel of God. You see that same phrase, ministering the gospel. You see it later on in verse 19. He says, I have fully preached the gospel of God everywhere that I've gone. In verse 20, he says, I have aspired to preach the gospel. If there is any confusion about the foundational work of what a missionary does, they preach the gospel. This message they carry to the nations. This is what they need to hear. In fusion, we have a motto and we, we say, so others may hear and live. And this is the motto of the missionary. I do all that I do so others may hear and live. Hear the gospel and live forever. This is the foundation. This is what Paul was called to in Acts 20. He says, I am testifying solemnly to the gospel of the grace of God. In Acts 22, he says, I am a witness for him. You all have in your, your foyer here, it says uh, above the door, to be my witnesses among all nations. This is the calling of the missionary. To take that gospel to those who have never heard. But fourthly, we see that the missionary offers to God those who place their faith in Christ. You see that in verse 16. In verse 16, Paul writes, ministering as, the gospel, the, as a priest the gospel of God so that my offering of the Gentiles may become acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. What is the goal as the missionary goes to the nations and proclaims Christ? The goal is this, that people would hear the message and as Romans 10 says, they would call on the name of the Lord and be saved. That's the goal. That men would be saved, that women would be saved, that families would be saved, that people would come to faith in Christ. And here in this passage, Paul 
uses a metaphor for his work as a missionary. He says, my work as a missionary in preaching the gospel is like a priest. Well, in the Old Testament, what did a priest do? A priest, according to the law of God, the word of God, would receive worshipers coming to the temple and would receive their offerings and they would make the offering and the worship, worshiper acceptable to God, sanctified for God's holy purposes. So they bring these offerings and the priest, according to God's word, would offer those offerings to the Lord in the temple. And so here's how Paul's ministry is like that of a priest. As Paul and as missionaries go to the nations, they proclaim the word of God. And as people hear about the cross and they hear about the message about Jesus Christ, what is God doing through that message? He's making the believers acceptable to God. They're an acceptable offering to Him. It's as though these people now have become the sacrifice, a pleasing aroma to God. And so as missionaries go to the nations, they're making these thank offerings to God, which are the people who are coming to faith through the message of the gospel. And so that's how Paul uh, compares his ministry to that of a priest. You can see the same thing in verse 18 when he says that my ministry is resulting in the obedience of the nations. That's the goal, that the nations would come to the obedience of faith in all nations. One uh, illustration or metaphor for the ministry of uh, a missionary, Paul uses this metaphor. The missionary is like an ambassador. What does an ambassador do? An ambassador goes from one country to another country and represents the interests of that country in another place. Uh, In the first century, it would be you go out from one king into a new kingdom And you seek to make sure that there are peaceful relations. And so this is how a missionary is is like an ambassador. A missionary goes out from the kingdom of God into the kingdom of darkness and declares to men and women everywhere, be reconciled to God. You are at odds with our king. You are opposed to him. And if he comes to you in anger, you will be crushed. You will be condemned. You will be judged. You have no hope if you continue to rebel against our king. But peace terms are being offered to you today. In the gospel of Jesus Christ, missionaries offer the terms of peace. If you trust in Jesus and what he's accomplished on the cross, you have no enmity with God. You can be forgiven of all your sins today. You can be reconciled at peace with our king and have no fearful expectation of judgment. That's good news. And that's how missionaries are like ambassadors to the nations. But the second uh, sketch we need to see here in this passage of a missionary is that we need to see the results of a missionary's labors. Look at these results of Paul's life in verse 17. Therefore, in Christ Jesus, I have found reason for boasting in things pertaining to God. For I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, resulting in the obedience of the, of the nations by word and deed, and so on. You see what's happening in this passage. Did you hear what Paul said? He said, I have reason for boasting. Am I the only one who's a little bit uncomfortable at a man saying that he's boasting? Well, here's the beauty of it. This is not sinful boasting on behalf of Paul. Paul is boasting, as it says there in that verse, in Christ. He says, I will not presume, I will not venture out, or I would not dare to boast in anything except what Christ accomplished through me. And this is what we see. The first result of a missionary's labors is that the missionary's labors result in Christ receiving all glory. All glory. We see this uh, happening in several ways. As the nations come to obedience of faith when they hear the gospel, how does that happen? How do missionaries lead people to faith in Christ? Christ. 
And if the missionary is doing it, if Paul's doing it, why is Jesus getting the credit for it? Well, we see it here because all the means employed by Paul and all the means employed by missionaries start and end with God. They start and end with Christ who's accomplishing it all. Look at this first means in verse 18. He says, this results in the obedience of the nations. And he says this first means right here, by word and deed. Another way of saying that is gospel words and a gospel-shaped lifestyle. Words and deeds are the way that the nations come to faith. Philippians 4.13, Paul says that, uh, through, through Christ, I, or through, through Him, I can do all things. He's the one who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This is why Jesus gets the glory. If it's Paul's words and Paul's life, why does Jesus get the glory? Because the only way he can preach a gospel is if there's a gospel at all. That's Christ's message. All glory goes to Christ. The only way Paul can have a life that's transformed was because he was plucked out of the kingdom of darkness and saved, and now this transformed life is to the glory of Christ. He gets the glory from beginning to end. But not only that, this next means is that the testimony of God, this next means is the testimony of God to the message through the miraculous. You see that in the phrase in verse 19, in the power of signs and wonders. In the power of signs and wonders. Through signs and wonders, Christ got all the glory. Why is that? Paul can't do signs and wonders. Christ, God, the Holy Spirit, he did the signs and wonders. Why, what were the point of the signs and wonders? The signs and wonders were for this reason. God is saying through these, these miracles, this message is my message. Therefore, dead man walk. This messenger is my messenger, the sick are healed. God was testifying through these miracles and these signs. There are signs pointing to the fact that this message is true and this messenger is reliable. And so today, God continues to move in miraculous ways on the mission field and through missionaries, but they don't necessarily need miracles anymore because we have the record of what God has done miraculously through Christ through his work, and God has once and for all testified to Paul's message and to the messengers that preach his message through what's recorded here. And so, yes, God is still doing miraculous things in the nations. You will hear of Muslims coming to faith in Christ through dreams and visions, and a, a messenger comes and proclaims the gospel to them. You will hear of these things. But the beauty is, is that once and for all, the work has been done. God has testified, this is my gospel, this is my word. But the third means that gives glory to Christ and that missionaries have at their disposal is the power of the Spirit to convict, convince, and convert. You see that there in the phrase, in the power of the Spirit. Folks, when missionaries go to the nations, they're preaching a foolish message. They're coming into a foolish enterprise. To think you could come in and say to, to a Hindu, you've been worshiping idols your whole life, but they're not gods at all. They're creations of your own hands. To think that that would persuade someone who's been taught something since they were children. They've believed something else their entire life, and now you're coming proclaiming this new name they've never heard of, this new good news that they've never heard. Are we fools to think that that would persuade anyone? Perhaps we would be unless the Spirit of God were at work. The Spirit of God convicts people's hearts of sin and righteousness and judgment. And it's by the Spirit of God people are convinced that this gospel is true. And it's by the Spirit of God we come to faith. And He regenerates us. He causes us to come to life. We are born again by the power of the Holy Spirit. All of this from beginning to end whether it's this power of the Spirit, or it's the testimony of God through the miraculous, uh, or it's the gospel message and the, and the lifestyle that accompanies it, all the glory goes to Christ in missions. The second uh, result here of the missionaries' labors that we need to see is that the missionaries' labors result in the full preaching of the gospel from place to place. Look at verse 19 one more time. Paul says, from Jerusalem and round about as far as Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel 
of Christ. That's the goal of missions. That going to a place where Christ has never been heard, the gospel would be fully preached from place to place to place. Can you believe that? Paul says from Jerusalem all the way around to Croatia, my work is done. My task is finished. He says later on in verse 23, I have no more room to work in these regions. Well, we should ask a very good question. What does he mean that he's done? That his work is complete? Well, if we were to read Acts chapter 20, which was written really close to when Acts chapter 15, or sorry, Romans 15 was written, we would see that Paul doesn't just mean that in every place and to every person he explained the gospel. What he means is he's laid a foundation that can be built on for the ages and generations to come. What do I mean he's laid a foundation? He's come to a place where there is no church and he lays the foundation of preaching the cross. He preaches the good news of Jesus. And people hear that message and they call on the name of the Lord and they're powerfully saved and then they begin to gather together in a church. And as that church begins to gather, leaders begin to rise up from within their midst and elders are appointed. And when that happens, Paul says, the foundation here has been laid. My work's done. Not that there are no more unbelievers in this region, but there's Christians here now. There's a church here now. They can sufficiently evangelize and share the gospel with their neighbors. And so as for me, I'm moving on. I've got other places to go. And that's going to lead us to our our third sketch of the missionary, which is the aspiration of a missionary. Look at verse 20 with me. Paul says, Thus I aspired to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, so that, they would, that I would not build on another man's foundation, but as it is written, they who had no news of him shall see, they who have not heard shall understand. What drives the missionary to go to the nations? What is their aspiration? What holy ambition has gripped their heart? It's right here. The missionary aspires to preach the gospel where Christ is not known. You see him say here in this word, I aspired. This passion for those who have not heard has gripped Paul, and that is what might be gripping people in this room. That's what may grip this church to say, we can't, be, we can't settle, we can't settle down and build roots here, we can't just hoard up resources and gifts and treasures so that we can live comfortable lives here in Iowa. We've got to sacrificially give and leverage our people and our resources that the gospel might be known to those who have never heard it. That's what grips our hearts, to know that without this message, there's no hope. That there are people who are being born right now, are living their entire life, and who have an expectation of dying. And unless something changes, unless somebody shows up to preach the gospel, they will have never heard their entire life, and they have no hope but, but a fearful expectation of judgment in front of them. That's the aspiration spoken in the positive but he also speaks it in the negative. He says that the missionary moves on from places where the gospel has been fully preached. He says that when he says, I would not build on another man's foundation. Do you hear that? Where the foundation has been laid of Christ being preached as crucified and a church gathering and leaders developing, Paul says, I can't stick around, guys. That's what he says to the Ephesian elders in Acts 20 you will never see my face again because I've got to get to Spain. How can they hear unless someone preaches? And how can they preach unless they are sent? And so this leads us to our conclusion. You've seen today that the ministry of a missionary, you've seen the results of the missionary's labors, and you've seen the missionary's aspirations. I hope you've been able to see in the ministry of a missionary that they're appointed by God to preach the gospel among all nations, to lay that foundation of the church. You see the results that Jesus gets glory in missions. That's what our lives and that's what missions is all about. 
It begins and ends with the glory of God. And you see our ambition. Missionaries can't stop, won't stop. They have to keep taking that next hill where Christ is not known. I hope you better understand a missionary today. But it's not just enough to have knowledge. The purpose that this passage is here before us today, perhaps what the Lord is doing in in your midst today, is that you would begin to be even more faithful, even more effective in your labors to get this gospel to the ends of the earth by raising up, sending out, and supporting missionaries. How can you do that? Number one, I encourage Cornerstone Church, be selective. There are so many ministries, so many uh, so-called missionaries going into the world. Be selective that this is the mission you invest in. This is the, this is, when Jesus said, go and make disciples, this is what he meant. We can see in Paul and his team, this is what they invested their lives in the preaching of the gospel, the establishing of churches, and the reproduction of that throughout the whole earth. When I say be selective, make sure your money and your people are going to be leveraged for that mission because that's God's mission. And so settle for nothing less. Second, be generous. I've already heard stories of how this church is being generous for the cause of missions. Do so all the more. Uh, As missionaries come home, figure out ways that you can hear their stories. Figure out ways you can host them in your home. Buy a mission house. Be generous to make sure you are hospitable to missionaries in this church that you support. There's going to be people who rise up from this church. Make sure you're ready to leverage your resources and invest in them. Be generous with your time. When missionaries come home, they want to share their stories. They're coming home to something that doesn't feel like home anymore because they've been changed on the field. Be generous with your friendship. Be generous with your fellowship and your family. Finally, identify, develop, and send. Perhaps today there are people in this room that's saying, gosh, when he's reading this verse about those who had no news, I feel like the Lord's tapping on my shoulder. I can't sleep at night when I think about the lost. I can't stop thinking about those who have never heard the name of Jesus. Perhaps the Lord's tapping some of you in this church, and I imagine very soon he'll be raising up your children to be future missionaries. And so be ready. Be ready to celebrate with them when they sense God's call. Put your hands on them and prayerfully send them out. Be careful that you don't say, there's lost right here in Lucas County. Yes, there are, but there's a foundation here and there aren't foundations out there. Keep sending, keep supporting, keep developing, keep raising up missionaries from your church. 